Okay. Well, okay. I think we should get started. All right. So I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Roseanne Hassett, and I'm the executive director for TACTA. And tonight's presentation is going to be on the effects of nuclear radiation, presented by Sharon Packer. And Sharon has been on the board of directors for TACTA for over 20 years, probably maybe even over 25. She served a very long time. And Sharon is an expert in civil defense and in NBC shelter design, which is nuclear, biological, and chemical shelter design, and has designed and installed underground shelters all over the world for the past 30 years or so. Sharon also has a bachelor's degree in mathematics with a minor in physics and a master's degree in nuclear engineering. So she's definitely an expert on the subject tonight, and we're so glad to have her doing this for us. Uh, before we begin, I need to let you know that nothing in this presentation should be considered legal, medical, or financial advice. The opinions of the viewers can differ considerably and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of TACTA. You should always do your own research and consult with professionals. The format tonight is informal. We like to allow questions on the fly so the answers can be given in context. So feel free to use the chat feature and we'll do our best to get those questions answered as they come in. So with that, we'll turn the time over to you, Sharon. Thank you. And uh, do you want us to have everyone mute until they're ready to ask a question? That That's might great. Yeah, if you okay. want to stay muted so that we keep it quiet, but feel I'll free to background noise. raise a hand or type something in the chat field and we'll try to get those answered for you as they come in. Or maybe you could just un un unmute and ask questions. But uh, to begin, um, I promised some of you that uh, I would talk just a little bit about the difference between a RAD and RAM and some of the terms that we use. And uh, quite ask, uh, stands for radiation equivalent in man. And when we're speaking relative to biological damage or to the human body, like cancer risks, then we use terms like REM or Siebert. The RAD, on the other hand, is, stands for the radiation absorbed by man from something emitting radiation. And then we speak of the RAD or the gray. And in America, we use RAD and REM. In Europe, they use uh, gray and Siebert. <laughs> so it's a matter of the SI units versus the uh, non-international system units. So in America, we use non-international system and the rest of the world, most all of the world uses the uh, SI units. So they would speak in terms of length like uh, meters and kilometers and centimeters where we speak in length as feet and miles and inches. And when we're talking about radiation in America, we talk about RADs or RAMs. And since we're talking mostly in our presentations about gamma radiation, then um, the reference to RAD and RIM are the same. So as far as uh, anything that we're talking about, RAD and RIM is the same thing. And I hope that simplified it. So a radiation is an eruption or emission of particles found in the nucleus of the atom. So we have uh, protons, electrons, neutrons, and, um, and these are all emitted from that in that process. And you can see how, um, how complicated that looks, but it really isn't as complicated as it might appear. And so um, we talk mostly of gamma rays when we're talking of uh, nuclear radiation. It has no mass, it has no charge, it, it, the range is considerable. It travels at the speed of light um, and uh, it's highly penetrating for that period of time during those first two weeks. And so that gamma ray you can see, can you see my little? Um, yes. Okay, so that gamma ray is not a particle. It's just a ray where the neutron is a natural particle, a beta particle, an alpha particle. So. Um, that, that is actually uh, has no mass at all. 
initial radiation I'll just mention, uh, it, it consists of neutrons and gammas. It has a range of one and a half miles from the detonation. It just lasts for a fraction of a second. It's highly penetrating, but you can see within a one and a half miles of that detonation, if you're not in a deep hardened structure, bomb shelter, you won't survive. So initial radiation is not a huge issue, but if some of you do have a hardened blast shelter and you're near a primary target, then we can talk a minute about that if you, if you wanted to know about shielding from initial radiation. And uh, neutrons, you can see um, they're large, where a beta particle is just a fraction of the size of that neutron. And uh, a beta particle is 1830 second the size of a neutron, almost 2000 times smaller than a neutron. An alpha particle, on the other hand, is two neutrons and two protons, so it's big. And the range in air is uh, six to seven centimeters. It, it's large, it's slow. Um, its duration can be long, can be very short. It's highly ionizing and it's an internal threat. And so alpha particles, um, you can see that how big they are. If one of those is 2,000 times bigger than an electron, then four of those <laughs> is 8,000 times bigger than the electron. So that alpha particle is very large. And it won't even penetrate through the skin of our body. And so it's not an external threat. And the beta, um, which is tiny, and we uh, mentioned that, it's negatively charged where the alpha is positive. And it's a, um, it can be short to very long lived. It does ionize. And again, it's an internal threat instead of an external threat. And when it gets on our skin, it can give us maybe a little, it looks like a sunburn, but it won't penetrate like the, uh, like the gammas do. And so beta particles are, are just um, still a threat, but they're a post-war threat. So if we get alphas and bays into our food or our water or the animals pick it up, that's what becomes a threat. And so after our two weeks, maybe we spend two to four weeks in our sheltered area or in our homes or in our basement, we what kind of, kind of food can we eat? Uh, how can we drink the water? What are going to, what's going to happen to our animals? And so um, the food, I wanted to make sure you all know that your canned foods, um, are just fine. The gamma radiation doesn't hurt them. And the alphas and betas come with the fallout. And so they're, they're part of that fallout. Um, and the fallout looks like dust. And uh, so dust gets on their canned food. You can rinse it off, you can wash it, and you can, answer, you can open the can and it's perfect good to eat. Uh, the same way with if, you, if it happened during the time of a um, uh, uh, harvest. We can go out and we can dig up our potatoes, we can pick our apples, we can wash them, we can peel them. But you wouldn't want to do that to a raspberry or a strawberry if you pick up all too many of those particles. So, so anything we can wash and, and that has a hard skin, then it's okay to eat it if we just get off that skin and wash it good. In the water, the radiation has mass. And so if we were saw standing water outside in a pond, those particles will get to the water, but they will eventually find their way down to the bottom of that pond. So if we had to forage for water, we could dip off the top of the water and then go about our uh, process of, of uh, purifying the water, but we necessarily get any radioactive particles in. And we do have in our uh, academy, and I hope you all know and have seen that academy. It's on our front page, I think, of our tactile website. There's a filter that we show that very good at filtering out any of those particles, those uh, beta particles. And so um, I hope you'll read that and, and study that tact academy. Animals, um, if, if they're not terribly sick, we could still uh, we can still slaughter a cow or, or uh, a chicken. We can do that. But the, the, the organs of the body are the part that filters out the radiation, uh, the radioactive particles. So we don't want to eat the liver, the heart, the, the organs of that uh, animal. And we don't want to 
boil the bones. So you'd want to strip the meat from that animal and just eat the meat and make the soup off the meat, but don't make soup off of bones because strontium looks very much like calcium. And uh, strontium, when it comes into the body, it will look for the bone of that animal. And if it gets into our body, then it will look for the bone of uh, our bones. And so uh, we basically want to stay away from those, uh, the bones of those animals. We can fish, we can uh, eat the, uh, the feeders that feed on top like trout, but we don't want to eat catfish or, or um, any of the fish that crawl, crawl along the bottom like the carp. And um, chickens, we can eat the egg, but uh, because the radiation is basically in the shell of the egg and not in the internal part of the egg. Are there any questions about that? I, I, so we, I have a ahead. question about um, the last slide about the water. Did you say how long um, we need to wait until we can dip water off the top of the pond or a lake to, to drink it? Well, you would you would probably be not be out there or even trying to do that for two or three weeks. So as long as fallout is still falling, you don't want to dip it. But if uh, fallout has stopped falling, then you can uh, and let it settle. You can dip it. And uh, if our water is in a container, the gamma radiation won't hurt that water. So a contained uh, water in containers is perfectly to drink. Any other questions on that? I have a question. Okay. Uh, what if the water is moving and stirring what up if, the bottom? Yeah, that's a good question. Like on rivers and things, uh, you want to find a place where it's warm because if it's muddy looking at all, then it, we know that it's picking up debris from the bottom. But if it's very clear and just moving slowly, then we can then we can pick it up and drink it. But hopefully you're all keeping water um, stored in some way at your home in 55 gallon drums or, or containers of some kind that are closed. Because that will be our limiting factor during that time. We just really can't go out. So uh, we're going to talk Jim, uh, mostly about fallout. Jim has a question, Sharon. Okay. Uh, yeah, are there any um, um radioactive nuclides that would be in a solution that would dissolve into the water rather than particulate uh, that settle out? Uh, I, during, after the fallout has actually come, I don't know of any. Gary, do you know of any that would actually, I, I know salt water could be, the salt in the water could be activated close on uh, if, the, if that were running through where there'd been a detonation, the salt water might become activated, the salt in the water. But other than salt, I don't know of anything that would be activated. Gary Sandquist, do you know of anything? Are you able to? Oh, you unmuted? need to unmute, Gary. You have to click your little microphone. So if Gary- uh, There if you Gary, go. Okay, go ahead. Some of the fallout materials from a nuclear explosion might be soluble in water. And actually, for example, sodium chloride is dissolvable in water and sodium 24 would be maybe one of the materials, but it's pretty negligible. That's the reason our advice is, is to have stores of water that is shielded and protected that, uh, that you may be stored. That's part of our program for TACT, isn't it, as to how to... Absolutely. Uh -huh. So that, that salt water in the ocean could, in some areas, become activated, but it, then it would, an ocean is so big, it would, it would soon, it uh, yeah. uh, but sodium is an issue. Okay, so it is the most far reaching of all the weapons effects. So we want to, that's why we've kind of started out with, with radiation in our, uh, in our uh, lectures. But um, I'm sure you all know that radiation, you actually see the dust and the small particles that fall uh, from, from the cloud. And if you don't see dust and small particles on the ground, if you're, you know, you look out on your sidewalk, if it isn't dusty, then you have very little, if any, fallout. Well, it's a good sign if you're not seeing dust. And if you are, you want to get some protection. So in my 72 hour kit, I like to tell people to get a, um, to get a, uh, uh, some kind of a raincoat so that you can cover your hair and your clothing if you had to hurry and get from one place to another when fallout had just started. 
so that you're not pulling those fallout particles in your sheltered area and it's not getting in your hair. But if fallout has started that first little bit, it's, it, you know, you can get in as quickly as you can and get protected. So uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about the type of burst, a high altitude burst, like uh, we had in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, that doesn't provide, it doesn't produce the fallout because the, the fireball has to hit the, the ground and when it hits the ground, it picks up one half to one times the yield of that weapon. So a 500 kiloton weapon would pick up 250 kilotons of, of, um, of dirt or debris and maybe even 500 itself. So it picks up a lot of dirt and debris. And when it is pulled up into that stem and into the fireball, that's when it fuses onto all of those particles that it's pulled up from the dirt. And then it literally comes out as, as a as a ball out, but the, I, I see I've differentiated between high and, and air, and I'm talking more of an air burst when we talk about um, uh, uh, the Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The high altitude probably would be used for an EMP weapon, and we wouldn't see anything much, we wouldn't see the fallout from that, although there are some particles that, that get into the stratosphere and they'll go around the earth, but uh, they fall out and be much uh, smaller of an issue for us uh, as far as fallout is concerned. Uh, surface bursts again, that's when they actually pick up that dirt and debris. And subsurface, we do some testing with subsurface weapons, but I don't see um, any use uh, that the uh, enemy would have for a subsurface burst other than maybe after a submarine pen, I don't know, but, uh, but I think our issue would be an air burst or a surface burst and certainly an EMP from a high altitude burst, but there's no, we wouldn't expect any radiation and fallout from a high altitude, only from actually the surface burst. And, and it's been my understanding when I have talked to planners that they say that they think that any of the um, cities or uh, uh, large cities like that, they most all of them would be hit with an air burst if they were going, planning a, 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 a weapon for that city that would be an air burst rather than a surface burst. And surface burst would be used to park long runways on airports uh, and, and on uh, military bases or to go deep into those bunkers. So um, they, I think they want to, to limit that fallout here if they were uh, planning as, people think, seem to think they would. Um, and of course that fallout is carried in the nuclear cloud. It moves along by winds. Uh, and we talk about the prevailing winds and basically those winds come from west to east, but it isn't a perfect rule. And so at different times of the year, they might change a little bit, but the basic fallout pattern will be from the west to the east. So if you had to leave a city and uh, you knew that there had been some kind of a, of a burst there in that city or at, at some target, then you would want to go north or south rather than move towards or with the uh, nuclear cloud. Uh, a rain out occurs when, um, when all of that fallout actually seeds the clouds. And if it rains, it pulls that radiation down very quickly and then it's hotter, it hasn't had time to decay. And so a rain out does cause more problems for us. Uh, the train does, terrain does give us a little bit of a difference in the fallout patterns and oceans do as well, but um, uh, that's basically how it's carried. The principles of the protection from the, the fallout is time, distance and shielding. <clears throat> And any one of these we should use to our advantage. So time, uh, we would talk about a radioactive half-life and that's the uh, time required for um, uh, that element to decrease by half of its original value. And all of these elements have different half-lives. And so for instance, <clears throat> um, uh, the iodine-131 that we worry about for our thyroid, it has a half-life of eight days. And so after 10 half-lives, then it's not going to be a threat to us anymore. It'll be a very minimal threat after 10 half-lives. So that means after 80 days, then that iodine-131 should not be a, a, a problem to us, unless, of course, it's coming from 
a, a nuclear power plant that continues to spew out the, uh, the particles. But um, <clears throat> as far as a nuclear weapon is concerned, after eight days, that one is not an issue. But there are other particles, of course, that have much longer half-lives. They can be seconds, they can be years, they can be thousands of years. <clears throat> so um, the 710 rule, we see this is kind of one of those rules of thumb, and it's hard. I, I don't know that we can even prove it, but, but it seems to act this way when those engineers have, have watched this decay. And so every seven-fold increase in time, there's a tenfold decrease in exposure rate. So I don't know if I, I did, I put this on. So if you see, um, if you have a reading of a thousand, well, seven hours later, you would expect that reading to be 10 times less. So you'd have a hundred rad. Seven times seven hours later, which 49 hours or approximately two days, the reading we would expect to be around 10 rad. And seven times seven times seven hours, which is approximately two weeks, we would expect that reading to be one rad. So if we can wait this out, then that radiation is going to be much decayed. And that's why we tell people, you know, we want them in that shelter at least two weeks if they can stay in any sheltered area for that long. And uh, the inverse square law, so this is the distance law. Uh, a dose is inversely proportional, um, and I'm having trouble reading this here, uh, to the distance in air from a point of a gamma ray source. And so if, if to make this simple, <laughs> this, this um, uh, if the source is here and we go 10 miles and, and we're taking a reading at 10 miles from that source and we get a reading of a thousand rad. Well, two times that distance, which is 20 miles, two squared is four. So we can divide that thousand by four and we get around, we would expect 250 rad there. Three times that distance is 30 miles and three times squared is nine. So we would expect that radiation to decay to, by a factor of nine. So we would see around 11 rads, rad. And so, um, so if, we, if there is a nuclear event someplace, maybe at, a, maybe at a military base, and we know that, that we see that base and, and we're far enough away from it that, that it, we're not hurt by blast and we can leave, if you don't have a fallout shelter, you might want to get in your car and try to leave so that you can put distance between you and that detonation. So you can see how quickly it falls from uh, that, that rule. And so that's the inverse square rule. And I put up a few of the weapons here, a 200 kiloton, you can see, um, and I hope you can read it, but at, um, at the detonation point here on the left, after two hours, we're looking at around 50 rad per hour. And it, it starts decaying as you go. And after about eight hours, we have gone, and if we follow this down here, we'd expect it to have traveled around 115 miles and we're at a half rad per hour. And so half rad per hour is pretty easy to deal with. And so if we're that far away from it, then, then we can deal with it. A 500 kiloton, well, we're going to get into that, uh, that area probably very close to the same. A one megaton, um, after, um, after 12 hours, uh, we'd have to be around 170 miles to get into that 0.5 rad per hour area. So you can see how quickly they go, they move. They follow those winds, and if it's 15 miles an hour, you can kind of base an estimate about how far it's going to be and how long. But after that period of time, they are going to decay. And then the next thing we have to look at is shielding, and we call that the protection factors, or PF, and you'll see that PF in a lot of the things you read. And that's the ratio of the fallout expo exposure uh, uh, to a, an un shielded area to the shielded area. So if you have, um, uh, if you had uh, a, a protection factor of two, that means you have protection of half of that radiation inside your shielded area. So shielding uh, 
a, a protection factor, we would hope that if you had a fallout shelter, you would try to get into the 1000 um, protection factor and it's not terribly difficult to get. Um, the half value thicknesses that we would put overhead will steel, you only have one inch to give you half of the radiation, but steel is very expensive. So you'd have to have 10 inches of that to give your protection factor of a thousand because 10 of those uh, those halvings would give a thousand. Concrete is three inches. So you'd have to have 30 inches of concrete and 30 inches of concrete is very expensive too. But earth is four inches and dirt is dirt cheap. So 40 inches of dirt or sandbags, things like that are going to give you a lot of protection and water, you probably wouldn't use that as protection because you could lose it. But so Sharon, uh -huh. there, is, there is a question about, can you use water for protection for uh, an improvised shelter? Yes, you can. And so if you were going to shelter in your basement, now we are going to talk, let's talk about that improvised shelter. If you're in a basement, you already have a protection factor of about 10, just because of all of the mass that's overhead, the ceiling and, and the roof over that. And so you'll have between five and 10. And so if you've got all of your water barrels around you, then, uh, then you've got a lot of protection from maybe, maybe your basement is a little, uh, has a little bit of a basement showing above grade outside. So if you have water, around you and stacked, that's going to give you some good protection. And then if you maybe have a, a heavy table, like a pool table in your basement or something, find a good place for it. And you could put books on it, you can put sandbags on it. And if you could get that up, you've already got a perfection, protection factor of 10. If you've got a protection factor of eight inches of dirt, that's two more. Now you have a protection factor of 20 because you can multiply it, it's multiplicative. So a protection factor of four inches of that dirt and your, and your which is one protection factor. Uh, so you can multiply one half life, uh, one halving, and you have your 10, so that's 20. If you have two sets of four inches of sandbags, so you've, now you've got eight inches, now you've, you've got uh, your uh, two more and two times 10 is, is 20. So, so uh, we can build that. And so I would suggest that if you haven't got a fallout shelter, that you get a place in your basement or the inner part of your home and you find everything that you can have. Like if you have a protection back. those happening five of those eggs then Sharon you're going to have a protection fact yes um I think your computer glitched for a minute I don't think we heard yes. the last thing that you just said maybe the last 15 or so seconds that you you were talking about oh Can you, Sharon, can you unmute yourself? Something just happened. I think you need to unmute yourself. No, we've lost. Okay, I'm and I and share, I share my screen again and let's we see. Also, yeah, somehow, somehow we lost your screen. I think um, we did. We had a little glitch there. It's on now. Am I on now? Yes. Okay, there we are. There you go. Okay, so the point is, if you can get those halvings, anything that you have, if you can put um, an inch of steel over that building or over that table or, or uh, uh, some sandbags or books or anything, the heavier you can get, the better. And if you could get up to 40 inches on that heavy table, then you've got a, a protection factor of a thousand already. So you really don't need that much, but, but uh, you can see how that is multiplicative. So we multiply the 10 by however many more halvings you can get. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> Hope that that explained it. So um, again, four inches of uh, dirt and soil will give you a protection factor of two. 
and then eight inches will give four, and then eight, 16, and all the way up to 10, 10 halvings of a thousand, a protection factor of a thousand. So you just multiply two by itself 10 times and you get to a, over a thousand. So if you have 10 times 20 inches, you've got a protection factor of 200. You're 10 in your basement times the 20 inches of soil. So let's talk a little bit about the radiation penalty chart. And so um, if we accumulate 150 rad in one week, then we're most likely not going to have any medical care needed. We don't want to have more than 150 rad. So kind of keep that in mind. 250, some medical care, few de deaths, but some, some care. And 450, half of us would die. 600 is a lethal dose. That's in one week. If you can spread that over a month, however, and you have your dosimeter and you know how much radiation you're getting, then that 150 goes to 200 where no medical care is needed. And over a four month period goes to 300. So you want to spread that dose over as long a period as you can. So if you're, especially during those first weeks, if you're in that shelter, try to get as much shielding as you can during that first two weeks, because um, that basement shelter is not gonna be perfect like those deep underground fallout shelters. So stay there as long as you can and add as much shielding as you possibly can those two weeks. And then you're gonna accumulate just small amounts for the rest of that time. Sharon? So, Yes. What if you don't have a basement? Well, then we're we asking to... on chat. Okay, and we're going to go to the center areas of our homes if possible and put as much shielding as possible. And then we're going to look at this. See this, this we don't have much protection factor in our home, only about a two, one and a half to two. But if we start building water and all of our food storage and whatever we can put overhead, we can multiply that two by a lot. So you in, don't have to have a basement yeah, to get so, protection. So, you just have to build it around you. Around you. And so here is kind of a basement. It, it's kind of a lower area that has a, the basements kind of showing. You could get between two and 10 out of that, depending on what the walls are and how much shielding you have around you. If you have a one-story home, you're going to get a protection factor of about 10 in your basement. And, and a two-story home, you're going to do better than that. And if you were in an apartment building, look at this 250 uh, PF in the upper parts, not the top, because you'll have radiation on the top floor. But if you go down into the middle in those areas, you're going to have only about 250 or into the basement area of that apartment building. See how much protection you have all up there. That's all going to act as protection for you. There's going to be some from the sides, but uh, you're going to be greatly protected if you're in the basement of a large apartment building. So um, in a two-story building, then if you put shielding around you in that shelter, you could easily get 250. And in this very large apartment building, see how much you can get a thousand out of those. And see, and then even in, and in lower basements, you can get a thousand. So um, that's, that's a lot of protection you can get. So just as a review again, if we have a protection factor of five only, then we're going to need a lot of medical care. We're not gonna be able to work, more than half of us die. And, and, uh, and if, you're, if you're getting that in your shelter, then you're going to expect a lot of deaths. With a protection factor of 10, then you're gonna have less than 50% deaths. If you have a protection factor of 20, 30, or 40, less than 5% deaths. And those deaths would be to your old people, your uh, people that have other health problems. And that would occur in about 60 days. If you can get into the 60 and 80 factor, then you don't see any symptoms. So that's 60 and 80, that's not impossible to get when you're already starting with 10. All you need is another six. So are eight. And if you're looking at 100, 200, 300, you're probably not going to get any more than 
this much, no symptoms. So the better you can get that shielding around you, it's certainly to your advantage. And you have to think about it now and not after the bomb falls. You've got to start thinking about where is that protection. So um, think in terms of mass, anything heavier is going to be better. Water is good. All of those things are going to be good. So in a medium fallout risk area, then if we're getting medium fallout, this increases considerably. But we still have no, uh, uh, no symptom but a PF of 100 and PF of 30, you might expect 5% deaths. In a high fallout area, risk area, you've got to have some fairly decent protection because you're going to accumulate a lot of radiation. So if you're kind of looking, well, what kind of, where is my high fallout risk area? Well, look at your primary targets that are around you. Look at, um, uh, look at uh, air, airports, like I said, and submarine pens and, and um, anything that would an enemy would use as a retaliatory, as a consider a retaliatory, uh, uh, then they, they want to take that out. They don't want us to retaliate. So look around you and if you have something fairly close, and, and again, we, we want to look at those uh, fallout patterns from those weapons, but this is all on all of these charts, everything here I think is all on that TACTA Academy. Sharon, so again, here's our panel. Yes. Can we use, for yes. example, Salt Lake City? Like give us some examples of what targets would be in Salt Lake City. Uh, airport number one is a target because it has, uh, of course, it has a long runway and it's also a tanker wing. We hold, uh, we have a tanker wing there that would refuel our bombers. So that definitely is a primary target. Airport number two might be, but anytime you get a long runway that's long enough for, uh, for us to land one of our tankers, then that possibly becomes a, pen, a, a primary target. So Provo now, they're, they're getting that long runway or, or they have it. But uh, Jay, what do you think? You're more, you're, you would study this better. Hill Air Force Base certainly, but that's not right in Salt Lake. But what would you think, Jay? Uh, yes, I would say any, um, any long runway is a target. And, and unfortunately, I guess they're, uh, they're, they keep lengthening runways. Uh, they made actually Brigham City a, um, uh, longer runway. It's actually an alternate uh, to the uh, solid number one for, you know, in case the uh, solid number one is uh, unusable for some reason. And uh, like you say, Cedar City and, and now Provo is, um, you know, a lot of military things, you know, uh, perhaps Dugway Proving Ground, uh, definitely Hill Air Force Base. They actually have um, uh, mock silos uh, at Hill Air Force Base. And, uh, and so, you know, a, a sophisticated enemy might uh, not take a chance that uh, they are just mock uh, silos and would definitely try to hit those plus the runway at Hill. So um, that's mainly it, I guess. Um, uh, you know, defense depots, uh, you know, would be a, a target, uh, something like um, a thigh call or Northrop Grumman now, I guess. Uh, you know, the manufacturers, uh, uh, would definitely be tertiary targets and and uh, might not attract a lot of attention. And um, also, some someone else had a question: um, How far from the airport do you think you need to be from an airport with a long runway? Well, and this shows you exposure at thirty miles downwind, and so um, and I'm sorry, my internet showing unstable again. But after one week, when you're 30 miles away, down, downwind, now, of course, you might not be downwind, but if you're downwind of that target, if you're out in the open, 3,000 rad, you, you're going to die. In, in a shelter with a PF of 15, 230, you're not an 86, PF of 40, 86. So, so you can see after one week, I mean, you. Uh, what, how important it is to have a protection factor, and especially in this 40 range. And so after four months, in, I mean, we won't be there for four months to see it. In a shelter with the PF of 15, after four months, we've got uh, uh, 300 
accumulation. And so we need to compare this with those other penalty charts where we've shown you. Um, and uh, at, at 300, you can see after four months, it, you're not going to need a lot of medical care needed. You see here. And so a PF of 15 even is going to be huge for you. And uh, in, in a better shelter, you know, it's, it's even less. But if no medical care is needed after four months at three, 300, and if you have a protection factor of 15 in your shelter, and you're only going to accumulate 300, that's an important shelter, PF of 15. Because in that shelter in your basement, if you already have 10, four inches of dirt is going to give you 20, a PF of 20. So even four inches of dirt four inches of sandbags or four inches of books. Look how important that is, but put more than that on. So we need to get as much shielding as we can and compare these two charts because, uh, and I'll look and make sure that I have these two charts on that academy. And again, this is our buildings, how important they are. And so, um, uh, I think that this brings us to the end and we have 15 minutes. And so anybody has questions, we can. There's a lot of questions that have accumulated in the chat. Um, okay. Um, can I ask a question? Um, I'm not in Utah. I'm in um, we're in a kind of a high risk area in California. I'm close to Vanderbilt Air Force Base where they're sending out the ICBM missiles. So I'm kind of nervous about everything that's going on. And um, assuming that you don't have a basement or you know, any kind of um, shelter and the funds to really buy, build a bunker. Um, what is someone supposed to do if, you know, if you're in um, just like a single story home, which I'm living in, I'm not on the media, on the, on the base, I'm about 20 minutes away, but I mean, considering there is, a, you know, <laughs> that I would survive a nuclear, you know, hit to this area. What, what could I do? I mean, you know, what, what would I be able to do? I don't have, I wouldn't be able to build a bunker. So I've heard that, I, are you able to actually, you know, seal up your house so that it's a fallout shelter? I don't, I don't know, is this, is this possible well, at all? And you would, you would need a lot of shielding at that distance, but um, is there, I'd like to tell folks that just don't have the ability to do it and, and you would probably be one of them. Do you have a friend? I'm sorry, you're glitching out. I can't really hear you. Uh, if you had family or friends uh, further away that do have a basement, if you could uh, supply, uh, bring your supplies to them, then if you had to evacuate quickly, if there was an escalating crisis, when you evacuate, then you're a welcome evacuee and not part of the problem. You have your supplies, you have your extra clothes, you have some extra food, anything that you can bring to them if you have friendly people that are close by. And if not, make friends, because you are really uh, in a location. <laughs> well, what I'm just saying though, is that is there, there's no way that I could seal up my house so that it could be a fallout shelter. There's videos on YouTube that said that, that say that you can actually do that. <laughs> That you well, and, and now, uh, if you're sealing it against chemical biological, that's oh. one thing, you know, and, and even then it's very hard. But if you're sealing against radiation, if your home is fairly large and you have an inner room, then you want to look around at whatever you could use to put in an inner area that would be the, the, the furthest away from any of the outside walls in an inner room that you could put shielding around you. Maybe you have an inner bathroom and you could put up anything heavy, including mattresses on the outside walls, anything you can, you can put up there that is heavy around that area, then you're going to get more protection. And if you can bring in a little table, a heavy, good heavy table and put things overhead, then you have to put a little water in there and enough uh, and, a, and a small chemical toilet and you've got to put as much overhead as you can and then you have to wait there and you can stand anything for two weeks if it's going to save your life. Oh sure of course are you saying that I need to put some I mean looking at this diagram I don't know if I understand this does this mean I need to put things on the outs around the outside of my house is that what no on the outside of your room on the outside of that room, anything you can get on the outside walls of that room. So maybe you have a bathroom. And so you could put things up around that bathroom, anything heavy you can find. And like I say, including mattresses, anything you can find that's heavy 
that you can that you can uh, stack up around that area. And then when you're inside that area, uh, you have to have a little something overhead too because you're going to get radiation from your ceiling. So if you could, if that little room, wherever it is, is big enough to bring a little table in there, put things on top of your table to act as shielding. But you've got to just look around and see what you have, any kind of mass. But as far as, as um, uh, stopping up your, your windows and everything, that radiation walks right through your glass. So it isn't going to help to put plastic on your windows or anything. You just won't be able to breathe good. But uh, you've okay. got to get as much shielding around you as you can. Right, I see. Okay, well, I don't want to take up all the time. So no, that's okay. This is what it's for. Great question. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thank you so question. much. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Deborah. Sure. <laughs> this is Gary Sanquist. Can I make a comment? Please. Can you hear me? What I would suggest for any of us, given the Ukrainian crisis now and the possibility, hopefully not occurred, but that uh, the Soviet Union or Russia, I should say, should attack probably what I would do is identify where do you think that they would try to destroy you? your air, an air force base, a distillation, something else of this sort. And then just, if you can put as much mass between you and distance be sure where you think the strike would occur. But uh, you know, it, it would probably be a surprise and the, the real long-term concerns would be given that there has been an event and there has some, been some contamination, I've survived the initial start. I just have to be careful about how I might accumulate exposure afterwards. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we might see an escalating crisis. We say a bolt out of the blue is one thing, but um, uh, we might see maybe an EMP without a, an attack following immediately. And if you lost your power in an electromagnetic pulse, boy, I'd be heading away from any primary target areas and try to get to a place where there's better uh, hope for survival. So if you ha do have good friends that are further away from those primary targets, uh, take some things out there and, and learn how to get there and learn alternate routes how to get there and have your things that, uh, that you have to take ready so you could leave immediately. Um, so, uh, but uh, escalating crises, uh, we, I think we will, I personally think we'll see them and, uh, and they may just decide worst case scenario that, I mean, maybe they feel like the worst thing they could do would be to take out Washington or, or CQ3 or, um, and, and uh, you uh, communications and command and control centers. And, uh, and if, they, if there were any kind of a nuclear event, if they, if they use nuclear any place, I would be sure trying to start building up um, some, uh, some shielding around where I plan to stay. So if they started using nuclear in the Ukraine, for instance, I would immediately start anything I could. Um, and, and even then it's like, you want to start now, because we do see an escalating crisis now. This is, it, it is a warning time right now. So gather things around you and think in terms of what you could, could do. So any other questions? I was, I have a question about uh, how much water you would need around you. Cause I think water seems to be a very quick way to um, put shielding around you, especially in barrels. And Crescent Kearney has um, on YouTube, a, an old video with him having an improvised shelter in a basement where he uses water. So I was just, uh, I was just kind of interested in how much water hypothetically you would need around you. Okay, let's get back on that. I think um, um, so. A having is seven inches, so two of those havings would be fourteen inches. So if you have those big uh, uh, fifty-five gallon drums, they're about twenty-four inches. That's uh, three and a half havings in just a a, um, a water barrel. So if you had water barrels around you, and then you put a double water bar barrel within, you know, so you have a full casing of water barrels around you, that's some pretty good protection. Thanks. Yeah, I think the improvised shelters is really important because most a lot of people live don't have basements and um, a lot of people don't have money to, let's say, build a bunker. So I think uh, in reference to the rest of the public, the more that we can 
talk about or advocate um, that they can they can build and provide shelters and save lives, I think the better off we're going to be. Another well, thing to you. Go ahead. Yeah, another thing was that the uh, New York Times had an article oh, back about 2010 on thinking the unthinkable. And it was about the, uh, it was during the Obama administration and it was in reference to a terrorist strike and they ran computer simulations that um, supported Crescent Kearney's um, improvised shelter idea that um, improvised shelters do work and would save hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. And it was a reference to a 10 kiloton um, strike on a city. So anyways, thank you. Uh, and do get Crescent Kearney's book and we will, uh, that where, Roseanne, where are you putting that reference for Crescent Kearney's book? That's because it's free. Yes, that will either be I, uh, probably on the resources page or um, right in the store where the hard copy was listed. It's not up yet, but I plan to have that up by Monday. Oh, you can buy the book, but you can all also go to that website. Yeah, we're, we're out of the book, um, oh, okay. but I have seen it like on Amazon. You can get that on Amazon. So we're just doing the download. I just barely got uh, the download yesterday. So All right, if we can do that free. We can just download that book. And so, but think in terms, I mean, just surviving that two weeks is just part of the issue. Are you putting away food? Are you, you know, hopefully you put away water. Do you know how to purify your water and filter your water? Because you're gonna need water longer than two weeks and that uh, your utilities are gonna be gone. And so are you putting away long-term food, rice, wheat, beans, uh, oil, any two of rice, rice and wheat, rice and beans, any two of those is a perfect protein, but you do need oil. And think in terms of uh, coconut oil, has a shelf life that lasts forever if you get that virgin kind. And at Costco, you can get that virgin coconut oil and it's very inexpensive. And I buy a lot of that and put it away. But we have to have oil to survive. We can't survive on wheat alone. And if you want your food to be a little more interesting, then start getting 10, number 10 cans with, with uh, dried foods, dried vegetables, dried fruits, and, and uh, put those so that you can cook with those. And think in terms of how am I gonna cook it? So one of the lessons will certainly be on an alternative ways to cook our food. And uh, a, a wide mouth thermos jug, you know, they, those thermos jugs have a mouth of those big ones about like that. If you boil up some water in a wide mouth jug, a thermos uh, jug, and, uh, and I'm not talking about those big thermoses, I'm talking about a little thermos that you carry, you can put some rice or wheat in there and put the lid on and you have hot cereal in the morning. And so uh, uh, pressure cookers, if you can bring a pressure cooker up, uh, to, to, um, to pressure, then just leave it all night. You don't have to keep that flame going. You can use the minimum amount of fuel and um, so we, we do uh, need to talk about, and, and there are things in our TACT Academy on how to help you uh, cook without power. And if the pioneers did it, we can learn how to do it too. We've not had power that many years and, uh, and we need to learn these skills and think in terms of, of, uh, of just having none of the uh, technical uh, things that, that we do, we need to, we need to think in terms of pioneers. Any recommendations on how long you need to take potassium iodide or potassium iodate? And are there uh, certain ages at which it's not necessary anymore? Uh, Jay, do you want to talk about it or do you want me to? You're probably up on it better. Um, you can. Um... You know, I, I'm thinking it's, uh, I, I've heard 80 days, something like that. I, th I think that was the, yeah, uh, we had several half-lives of uh, the strontium and, um, and the radioactive iodine. And, and so, um, but um, people that are elderly or have any thyroid problems, they probably shouldn't do it. They shouldn't take it. it uh, and if they've had their thyroid out, it's not going to help them. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't think that we should, I absolutely would not recommend taking that as a prophylaxis. We shouldn't be taking it before an event. If there is an event and uh, you're, and maybe you're fairly near to a, um, uh, maybe a, a power plant or something, then you want to have that available to you, but uh, the children more important than the uh, elderly. 
Yeah, you shouldn't actually take uh, the potassium iodide unless you can actually see fallout, or you know, it's it has to be a fairly severe ra uh, radiation event to to get you well, the, not, the radio if not, of iodine. If you're not seeing fallout, then don't take it if you don't see right. the fallout on the ground. There's a question um, on the chat. Somebody wants to know if the authorities would tell you how much radiation was there so that you would know if you need to take the KO3 or not. It's questionable. And um, if we have battery powered radios that survive the EMP, we might be able to get that information. Uh, I just don't know if they would be transmitting or not, but we recommend in our communications to classes that you get um, in your community, you try to gather your neighborhoods and get them to get um, their your little um, handy talkies or whatever, walkie talkies or family radios, and you protect those, you wrap them in your couple of layers of, of uh, aluminum foil so they're protected from EMP, but after the event, after the uh, a little bit, then um, you can talk to one another and somebody will have a radiation meter. And if you get, if you have a ham radio operator, talk them into having one of those walkie talkies because they're line of sight and you can go from line of sight for quite a few miles until you can, uh, if, if you put it uh, into effect beforehand. And so we had something pretty good going for a while in Salt Lake. Uh, we had, we exercised those every month and, and people on the walkie talkies would go from one place and then bump over to the next place and the next place until they found, a, uh, found their um, ham radio operator, their amateur radio operator. And he will be able to find, um, uh, uh, if you go, if you're able to get into um, Denver and I was on my amateur radio, I heard them all the time because we exercised, then he would have information from Denver. So that would be quite a, a nice thing if you were able to get some amateur radio people and your communities organized, even if it's your own, only your, your neighborhoods, get them organized and see if you can't get them to do things like that. Great. Other questions? Actually, if I could, uh, Sharon, you said about the early pioneer recommendation. Uh, this is Adenosa, who's the uh, Christopher Gist, was George Washington's guide. And this is just a wonderful book uh, that goes through. He saved Washington's life twice. Uh, once when Washington went under the uh, horrible uh, icy Monongahela, and a second time when an Indian scout uh, tried to kill Washington. But it's a phenomenal book about the miles they traveled and the hardships they used to endure. And uh, we're pretty soft these days, unfortunately. Uh, but this is really a, a wonderful book. And, and school children used to know this book well, what's uh, the name for hundreds of, of years. What's, what's the name of the book? It, it's, he, he was the speaker of truth, the, uh, the Indian tribes, the Iroquois and Delaware and everyone else. Uh, he always spoke the truth. And so his name in Indian, uh, in a, the Iroquois, was a speaker of truth. So it's Ananosa, if you look at it. And so guess. Is that book called A Speaker of Truth? Well, no, it's, uh, it's based on the life of Christopher Gist, G I S T. And so and the if you look him up, uh, actually, Epic, I don't know if anybody subscribes to Epic Times, but they, they're doing a wonderful series about George Washington and the first third is when he was young and impetuous and uh, hadn't really controlled a lot of his emotions. And uh, this guy Gist is the guy that really brought him along and taught him how to survive in battle and how to survive in the well, wilderness. We and, all need some inspiration. <laughs> that oh, yeah. would be fun. Thank yeah. you, that would be really fun. <laughs> okay. Any other Next questions? Time. You know, a suggestion is given the situation we are with the Ukrainians and what might happen, what Putin might order, it's doubtful that he would, he would be able to attack the United States, but it's possible. So the suggestion is, is to interact with your family, be able to assess to where they are and how they, how would you bring them together? What resources do you have? And obviously just follow the news very carefully, see what's happening. You'll be, you'll get some kind of an assessment as to where this situation is going. Hopefully, uh, 
Putin will remain sane and will not order an attack any farther. We'll see what happens. But it's conceivable if there were an uprising in the Soviet, well, in Russia, he may attempt to uh, to bring the world into it to rescue himself. Well, it's it's a difficult situation. We have to watch it carefully. We live in dangerous times. I, I can share that in the cyber war, we're winning. Uh, we're doing a lot of punt forward. And so we're actually identifying uh, places where they're trying to penetrate. And it's very surprising given the reputation that uh, Russian hackers have that uh, so far in the cyber war, they're definitely not winning. Sure. And so uh, that's unknown to most people because nobody's paying attention to it. But in a lot of ways, that's the more important battle. Uh, even though all the media is focusing on the conventional stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I think Ken. Go ahead, John. For Bruce, uh, what about the earlier reports of a couple of years ago that the Russians had hacked into our electrical grid? That's true. Not uh, done any damage or anything, but they knew how to get into it. Is that still the case? Well, they have no. in the past, certainly you look no, at- No, it, it, this is, it's past. always fluid. Uh, it's always fluid, but there are, I, I have nothing but respect for the people on our side that have done remarkable work. Um, and so, and that's regardless of politics. Uh, fortunately, the people involved in this are, are non-political and all they're concerned about is keeping Americans alive. And so, uh, they've done an incredible job. Uh, the Russian hackers did hit Ukraine and European sites and others. Uh, but the fact is that we held, and more importantly, there, there's a change in philosophy that happened probably four years ago that rather than letting them penetrate our systems, we would do what's called hunt forward, which means we go into there wherever they're messing around and we shut them down before they have a chance to do something. Now, when you have the rogue elements like the, uh, uh, you know, the hackers that are just out there for pure profit, and that's a lot of the ransomware crowd, they're, they're much harder to control because they're just acting on their own. But when it, when it comes to state actor hackers, the ones from North Korea, Iran, uh, Russia, and uh, other countries, Ch obviously the Communist Chinese Party, they hire the most. The, the genius of the Chinese, the Communist Chinese Party is they take a street criminal from Hong Kong and match him with a colonel from the uh, PLA. And then they're very good as a team. Uh, but uh, from what I've seen in the past three and a half weeks, uh, we've not only been able to stop the penetration, we've been able to identify a lot of avenues they've taken, which we didn't even know about. And that's the wonder of this. I mean, that, that's the whole thing. People are studying the tactics on the ground in Ukraine, but more importantly, we're studying the cyber war that's being waged, and we're learning a lot. Well, that's that's really encouraging. Okay, Roseanne, we're past our time. Do you need to? We are. We're uh, yeah. It's seven o'clock. Um, but if there are more questions, we're happy to answer and keep going. You can um, you can check out when you want to. Um, it's up to you. And up to Sharon, of course, if you have some more time to answer questions, if there are. I just didn't know if we had to leave at seven. Yeah, it's seven no, we don't. Quick question. Keep going. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Hey, uh, what uh, do you recommend regarding waste disposal when someone's in their shelter? And, and certainly that is a problem. And that's why I've suggested that we keep a chemical toilet. And I like to keep a chemical toilet for each member of the family personally. And, uh, and uh, the chemical toilet, but uh, you, can, you can use that for several days. But um, if you pre-dig a hole out now, while we see an escalating crisis, dig a hole outside I've, I've got straight and if you dig a hole and then fill it with sand or some softer so you're not going to fall in it but if you had to dig a hole quickly then you can you can dig that hole and if you were in your shelter after two or three days you could run out for a few just a minute 
to empty that chemical toilet and get right back into your shelter. So uh, that that is what I like. And there, I also have a, a partial composting toilet that's very good. Mm. So the, the partial compost toilet, um, uh, it, it doesn't uh, compost totally, but it doesn't have to be, um, it, it doesn't have to be vented. And then you take that compost outside and put it someplace where it can continue to uh, compost until you can actually use it for, for fertilizer. So uh, that partial composting toilet, I think is really neat. And I maybe we could put the name of that someplace on the side, I don't know, or maybe we can talk them into letting us carry it because I really like, uh, I recommend that often. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But make sure that you put plenty of water in that shelter with you and, and canned foods and something that you can eat uh, without preparing it. Don't forget your can opener. <laughs> There's uh, one more important thing we need to consider that if they don't do nuclear, but they do an EMP, then everything shut down. And uh, there's no grocery stores being refilled. So having that, your supply of food is so vital. And also, uh, I know Jim Phillips was going to talk about his cold weather clothing this time, but it's been pushed back a month. Uh, having those clothes that keep you warm year round, you don't have to worry about the fuel for, for you know, heating that structure. You have the warmth around you and you're wearing it and you're warm whether you're in or out of the shelter. And uh, he has his uh, free Zoom class meetings every week. Um, I think go to jimsway.com and you can sign up for free to, to get those classes. And he's been going over a bunch of uh, awesome classes about his cold weather clothing and how to make those and the sleep systems that go with them. And uh, those would be super helpful if we had those in advance that would uh, really make uh, it. So he's doing that every week, jimsway.com. Uh, Jim, do you wanna, I know you're, you're out there somewhere. Can you pop in and tell a little bit about that? <coughs> Unless he had to leave. Maybe he did. Yeah, I, I did. I was doing that Gotta get the unmute. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, to just jimsaway.com, you can register for the newsletter. I'm doing classes on different topics every Wednesday evening, but I'm also for just open forum Saturday mornings, nine o'clock. I'm there. We can talk about any topic whatsoever. So I'm, I'm doing classes twice a week. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock Saturday mornings is an open forum and 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. I'm doing a class. The link for that is uh, in my newsletter, uh, which I put out every every week. I put out a newsletter. It has the link in it. And so how do we sign up for your newsletter? On the uh, website, jimsway.com, there's a place okay. to sign up for it. It's uh, the Provident Living Times. And, and uh, how, what have you heard about Mike Black? Is he doing any, is he surviving? So far, uh, he took really tremendous, you know, injury. Uh, he had surgery today on his back. They've done his femur, they've done his arm, they've done his back. He did lose his right arm. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, he has, haven't, haven't heard how surgery went today, but uh, hopefully he'll recover here and it'll take months. And what about Wittes and Mike? Uh, he's doing okay. He's done a whole body cast. Okay. Broke a lot of bones. This is a bad time to get in that kind of trouble. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the update. And, and I do have a lot of uh, videos on my website that are there for free and people can watch them. So. Well, please take Thanks. note of that because Jim's uh, got a fantastic select, uh, collection of information. Great. Uh, and Jim, I'm sorry, how do you spell your last name? Uh, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S, Phillips. Thank you. Jimsway.com, correct? Yeah, that's the website, Jimsway, J I M S W A Y.com. It's also my YouTube channel, is Jimsway. Okay. And so uh, is it a Zoom meeting that you have? Yes. Uh, it's oh. Zoom both Wednesday night and on Saturday mornings. And so is there a limited number of people that can get in? I guess when so many people are in, it just cuts off or? Uh, it does. I can have 100 people right now. <clears throat> That's wonderful. Okay. We start, we get more. I'll, I'll expand the size of the, the site, but I've got a hundred seats right now. Wonderful, Jim. Thank you so much. That's wonderful work. And what are you covering next month's uh, civil defense meeting? What are specifically are you going to be covering then? 
I, I don't know if I'm on next week or if it's in May. I haven't heard, but uh, I'll be talking. Uh, part of it will be about the cold weather and uh, what you need to do to be ready to live without utilities is the bottom line, because this happens. We probably won't have, everybody won't have utilities. Maybe you will, but you got to think as though you will not have any utilities and be prepared to deal with it. Absolutely. So I um, think um, I think next month we have scheduled um, alternative power sources. And so I think we had pushed Jim at, until we were a little closer to the fall so that we could do that winter clothing or in the summertime, late summer. Yeah, I guess we'll have to we'll have to really we'll have to look at that because we had a April planned, but we can certainly make different arrangements. So we'll we'll let you know as soon as we know. We'll post that on the site, and then I'll I'll send out an email telling you what the topic will be. There's okay. an advantage of doing it early because it takes time to get ready. So you know, absolutely, we yeah. do a lot in the spring and the summer. Also, it's not just a seasonal thing to get ready for. Okay, so yeah, great, great. That we could make them during the summer. And if you don't want to wait, you can go uh, to his uh, his website, and he has a lot of the of the classes there that you're that are available that you can get. So if you don't want to wait, you can get them right now on the on his site. Great. Great. Sharon, uh, I think Jay may ask a question about uh, shielding for a neutron bomb because there's so much higher neutron radiation. What is, how does that different than regular conventional nuclear bomb? Uh, but the neutrons are attenuated more by, uh, like things like water. Uh, we're looking at something that is about the size of a neutron. So H two O would be a similar molecule size to the neutron, and so um, where gamma we have to have a lot of mass. In, in the neutron, it would be really uh, beneficial to, uh, uh, to shelter with water. But again, that the neutrons are only an issue within one and a half miles of that blast. And so when we had long um, entrances, uh, we tried to, when we're close like that, we recommend that you keep them uh, under 36, 36 inches or under. And we put uh, in one of our shelters, we put a little, um, um, rail track so that we could with uh, and made a, a a cradle with with um, like a little railroad cradle and we put our 55 gallon drums on those cradles and so when we came down our entrance we made a t at the bottom so that we came down vertically and the t went horizontally both ways from that vertical portion and so we pushed the water on its little track back into the back part of that t and then we let everybody in. And then when they were in, we pulled that plug behind them so that we blocked that area from neutrons. And it's a good gamma shield as well, but uh, uh, not as good as, as uh, heavy amounts of, of dirt. But when you're in a T like that, you've got a lot of protection because every 90 degree turn attenuates 90% of the radiation. So if you're close in to a, uh, to a, a, a target like that, then call me and I'll draw that out for you so you can see what we did, but it makes a pretty good plug. And then if somebody came late, then you don't have to take all your water canisters out of there. You just push your uh, 55 gallon drums, the two of them back into that back part of your uh, horizontal run and you can let people in and then pull it back because you don't want to leave yourself exposed for any length of time. Did, that, did you get a visual of that as I <laughs> explained it? But please don't hesitate to call me, and I can I can help you with that. Looks like our questions have stopped. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's see. Here's a chat. What is the web address for the resources page? Um, you know what, I don't know offhand because it's an extension of TACTA. So just go to tacta.org for the resources page. And it's right on the navigation bar titled resources. If you scroll to the bottom, it will show the Zoom presentations if that's what you're wondering. All, the, all of the Zoom presentations are recorded and you can view them later. Or if you missed, you missed a presentation, then you can 
watch it later. Okay. Again, Sharon. You're so very welcome. It was my pleasure. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much for joining everybody. It makes it makes the meetings better when we can all talk and share. And thank you, Sharon, for your time. You're welcome. Thank, thank, you, stuff, Bruce, thank you, Bruce Curley, for the uh, for the, the good news about our cyber warfare capabilities. Yeah, I mean, it's so sad that everybody's watching the media 24-7 and they're they're in a funk right now. And the fact is that uh, I don't know, at least in cyber, we're doing a great job. So, <laughs> and that's pretty critical right now. So, you know. Very critical. Good to know. Right. Very good to know. Also, in case you missed this earlier, a lot of what Sharon talked about tonight is in the Tacta Academy. And you can download that for free if you want that, or you can purchase the book. So you can get all of these notes from the Tacta Academy. Also, uh, Sharon, will you be um, sharing this presentation that I can post? Uh, the the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Uh-huh. Yes, you could. You okay. Can make, uh -huh. So I'll get that from Sharon and I'll post that also. A little right. hard to, to see it and not hear it talked about, but it would give them some idea. Yeah. And any, sure. hints, any hints, Roseanne, about when the 60th anniversary issue will be out? Well, yeah, it comes out in April. So always April, April. and October. Great. So, okay. Yes, this Looking is our 60th, to it. 60th year. We're lots of history. About that. Yeah, lots of history. Yep, TACT has done a lot of wonderful things over the years for people. Sharon. <clears throat> There was a couple more questions about uh, thyroid blocking agent, um, and I don't know if we thoroughly discussed. One of them said uh, uh, somebody has an old thyroid protection pills. Uh, should they discard them or get new ones? What is your take on that? I don't know what the shelf life is. I'm not discarding mine. <laughs> they say that the shelf life but, is 10 years. Oh, wow. I've, I've heard- As long uh, as you store them properly. I've heard a, an interesting take on that. Uh, they're they're actually a salt, and that is a mineral. It's a it's a you know, but it doesn't decay. Well, what decays is the binder in the pills, and so the binder tends to break down and it turns into a powder. But what I thought of doing is, uh, you can go to a laboratory supply store, and they have these little mini tiny little mini spoons that they use for for laboratory use for a small amount of an element or whatever. And uh, if you've got the right size spoon, that's about the same size as one of those tablets. Even if they all uh, went into powder form, you just put your little spoon in there and that's the same as one tablet's worth and you can still utilize those, uh, those, those old bottles if they're starting to break down. Great idea. Yeah. Jay, do you have anything to add to that? Anything about potassium idate? Maybe we ought to look up to see if there is anything that would be, uh, after a shelf life, if there's anything that would be dangerous uh, in it. I, I personally don't know, so I couldn't recommend, but like I said, I'm keeping mine. <laughs> yeah. I think Kylene Jones in a, a few issues back uh, in the Journal of Civil Defense, uh, they, they looked into the study that the Army requested on the behalf of their huge stockpile of medications for their troops to find out if these medicines are still viable, even though they're 10 or 15 years old. And, and they found that uh, most all of them were still viable. They just weren't quite as potent. So they might be 90% as effective, but um, so you, they, they were still good and the army didn't have to throw them out and waste billions of dollars in, in meds. But uh, we could look back in that article from Kyleen and past issue. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Questions about KIO three? Yeah, Sharon. How long do we need to take that for? Is that the, the eighty days or whatever? Well, uh, that's the half life. Uh -huh, 80, 80 days. So it would still be 
you know, it, it decreases in activity, but that is, is the length of it. And are they still offering that on the uh, from so uh, protector from the the website? I know they had it available at one point. Is it still available? Yeah, we um, we ran out really fast, but I just got another shipment um, just arrived today. That's going to uh, actually fill probably only half of my orders, but then the rest of my shipments coming next week. Um, the manufacturer says, and I should have more than enough so i'll put the extras i'll put them back up on the site so you can order them and, and roughly how much are those uh, is it a bottle and how many are in them they're about twenty dollars that is how much for how many people let's see i think there's 60 tablets i i think it's one tablet a day isn't it i haven't looked yep. at the dosage lately it is it's no, one tablet a day, so person. you need a you need a bottle per person, more than a bottle per person. Yeah, and after that, after sixty days, you probably are are very, it, it's very mild. Okay, so then you might not need a full tablet a day. I think sixty days they consider to be a full treatment. Okay, so probably one bottle per person. How do you handle little babies or little kids? They're they take like a quarter of a pill. So there's a chart. Yeah, there's a dosage chart on it. Mm -hmm. That's another thing to consider in your preps is a, a pill splitter and or a pill crusher. Mm -hmm. I've got those. Yeah, so I, if I got to the end towards that 60 days, I'd keep some of them and break them in half so that you're uh, bringing that a little further along into that 80 day period. But 60 days, you know, is they, you know, you you can you can still take a little of it after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we okay? Any other questions? Thank you again. What's that? we didn't catch that all right did, did you say that uh, there, you're getting some more of those uh, uh, nuclear war survival skills hard copies in or no that we can't get that anymore so it's out of copyright um i've been unable to find them in print anymore i think people are just selling kind of what they have because it's not a real popular book unless you're in trouble so right now it's a popular book so um but we do have the download and i'll have that up on the site by monday i just barely got that download do you know how many reams of paper it would take to print that uh, i don't know how many pages it is but um you can print on both sides you could print on both sides i mean it'd be worth it you can also yeah. find it i did find it still on amazon and how much are they going for? So, I don't remember if it was between twenty and thirty dollars, but I think it's I think it's worth it. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think um, somebody mentioned in the chat that Chris and Kearney had a um, instructions for a homemade um, what is it radiation meter. Yeah, and they do work, those little meters. You make them out of a tomato paste can, but dosimeters are not terribly expensive. And um, I would highly recommend that you buy a dosimeter. The meters have to be calibrated, but a dosimeter just needs to be charged. And so if you have a dosimeter, you're, it's like your odometer on your car. You're going to tell what kind of accumulation you have. And so I highly recommend the dosimeter. Yeah, and I, we don't have any right now, so you'll have to do some searching for that. Yeah. But definitely that's something for your for your shelter well that those similar would be one per person wherever they are right well that would be best unless you're kind of, but you can recharge it if someone had to go outside you can recharge it and put a good uh keep a good track of how many uh, how much radiation each person's getting so you can share it that way so you just bring it down to zero recharge it and let them go outside if they had to go out for a few minutes and then you can write down the amount of accumulation they had. 
And then if you're all in together, mm -hmm. then you kind of go by what you're all getting. One yeah. person is with the dosimeter. Uh, is there a good commercial uh, radiation meter? Uh, that's not terribly expensive. I don't know, and they have to, you know, you'd want them to be EMP proof, but I'm, I'm not investing in a meter. It's just too much trouble to keep them calibrated. The dosimeter is the best thing to have, and it's the simplest, and they're very durable. And inexpensive relative speaking to the, the meter. You need a meter if you're going to be going out and trying to survey and look at things, but if you're just sheltering in place and waiting for it to, uh, I'll say things calm down, then the dosimeter is going to take care of you. The one nice thing about a little meter, even if it's not been calibrated, if you have um, a little beta wand on the end of it, you can see what foods might have radiation on them after the event. So if you have any of those old FEMA uh, uh, meters, then you don't have to calibrate it. You just have to listen to the ticks on that uh, wand. And if the wands, you know, they increase extensively on that wand, then you know that you've got some radiation on that food or whatever it is you're looking at. Comment. Comment. Uh, with the uh, low level meters with the wands, they, they do saturate if you're in a high radiation level. So those uh, wouldn't be uh, helpful in a uh, situation where there's a large amount of radiation uh, that you'd have to wait till the the levels dropped before you'd really be able to use that uh, uh, for your uh, checking your beta sources. That's right. And so they wouldn't be really a use to you until after the uh, two or three weeks when you went out and hopefully the gammas had dropped to the point where it were just looking for a small levels under under a rad probably they're in milli rads and so they're considerably smaller than a, a full exposure for radiation gamma radiation now on those meters should you start with the highest range it's kind of like a digital multimeter you got two volts or 200 volts or 20 volts or 200 volts or 2000 volts you, you should start at the higher range and then work your way down so you're not bombarding a, a two volt reading when it, you've got 2000 volts. Uh, is it kind of like that with the radiation meter? You want to start at the highest range first and then work your way down? So. Yeah, you'd, you'd start at the higher range. Right. I, I used to be an instructor for the state of North Carolina for fire departments and rescue squads on using those meters when we had them available. Uh, and we would tell the people, uh, if you're going to like an accident, uh, take them both, have them both on, uh, cause if, if you start walking toward there, uh, and you get a reading, you might want to set the, uh, your, your low range meter down and proceed on with the high range. If you got to, got to take a reading. Right. That, that's good advice. Of course, hopefully we're not out there in the high, high range areas. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but you, as you know, an emergency responder, you had to, you had to do that. Yeah, you'd, you'd keep your distance and watch your shielding and, and not right. spend a lot of time. Right. <laughs> but that's not lesson one. That's lesson way up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it looks like we're through. All right. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you again, Sharon, and Hi. thank you everyone for coming. Thanks for supporting us. And we'll see you next month. The, uh, the meetings are the second Thursday or Saturday of each month, depending on when our presenters are available. So we'll see you next month. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.